Hello, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today for a discussion on two very important topics that are actually very closely linked, wages and inequality. Now, these are issues that affect the global economy, but they also hit very close to home. They have an immediate impact on businesses and families, um, and we are here to discuss fair wages and how we can better close the gap, wage gap. Um, I'm Abba Patrai. I'm the economics correspondent at the Washington Post. And before I move on to our panelists, I'd like to just note that ensuring fair wages is a priority for the World Economic Forum and is part of its good, fra good work framework. Um, if you are on social media and are tweeting about this or Instagramming, Snapchatting, what have you, please use the hashtag WEF22. All right. I would like to introduce our distinguished panel, starting with Neela Richardson, who's the chief economist at ADP, which is a payroll company in the United States. Next to her is Jean-Pascal Duversor, who goes by JP. <laughs> um, he is from the Czech Republic and is the CEO of Home Credit, which is a consumer lender um, throughout the world. And all the way at the far corner there is Mauricio Cardenas, who's a former finance minister of Colombia, who is now at Columbia University. All right, so I would like to start with you, Nila. Um, I would like to rewind to just the beginning of the pandemic. Okay. What were wages doing you know, before COVID hit? What were we seeing in the United States in terms of wage growth, in terms of inequality, and what impact has the pandemic had? It's great to remember, right? <laughs> so uh, before the pandemic, I'll bring you back to that lovely time period, uh, w the U.S. was enjoying uh, 10 years of economic expansion. Um, and there was a lot of good things about that expansion, but the secret of it was its tortoise-like pace. It was really, really slow, um, and inflation was really, really low. And so it was able to jump over business cycles for a decade-long expansion. What's also notable about that expansion is it took a really long time for wages in the United States to actually see growth. In fact, they stagnated. And the perplexing issue was, why weren't wages taken off despite this long expansion? The Federal Reserve, for all of its power in reducing uh, interest rates, uh, still was trying to generate some kind of wage growth, particularly at the lower end of the, of the wage scale. And they largely succeeded. As the economy was entering into this period, be right before the onslaught of the pandemic, that's when we were starting to see gains at the low end of, of the pay scale. But if, if I could just go back even prior, more theoretical to the pandemic, mm -hmm. um, Wages really grow for three main reasons, and you saw them all play out in this three-year, two-year period um, before, during, and hopefully at the tail end in most places, and eventually all of the pandemic. One, they grow because of productivity enhancement. That's grade A growth. That's, that just raises the standard of living for everybody. It's the kind of wage growth that even companies cheer because it raises profits, it raises uh, uh, lives, household lives, and children's lives all over the world. And so that's the kind of growth we want to see. The second reason uh, wages grow is because of composition. And that points to how uneven the pandemic was uh, during uh, the, the onslaught. It really hit low-income jobs and consumer-facing services the hardest. And so the net effect was wages looked like they were growing really fast, particularly for women who were hit very hard by this pandemic, when actuality we just lost a lot of low paying jobs. And then the final reason wages can grow, and this is something that is particularly acute in the United States, uh, where we have uh, what's been coined the great resignation, 11 and a half million job postings, uh, over 4 million quits, uh, and per pronounced labor shortages, they grow because of competition. Companies are competing for talent. Both of those latter two are not good sources of growth, and they actually lead to inflation. So as I hope we talk about wages uh, on this panel that we're particularly cognizant of uh, why they grow, um, we see at ADP, I'm, I'm their chief economist, about 20 million wage records a week. Uh, and we pay about 38 million workers around the world. And so when it comes to wages, we have this unique perspective about how this unevenness played out, and particularly who was hardest hit. And um, as we'll 
hopefully talk about. It's those low-skill professions pointing back to productivity and enhancements. Uh, those are, that's the challenge when it comes to inequality. Perfect. JP, you specialize in loans for people who have no credit history or perhaps little credit history. Can you tell me a bit what you're hearing from them? What are you hearing from their clients and how do fair wages pay, play into that? It's always complicated to sit on an economical discussion between two economists, <laughs> not being an economist by background. Um, so what do we see? So home credit is active uh, in Central Europe, um, in CIS, which right now is not a very uh, popular uh, place to be investing in, and in uh, Southeast Asia. Um, what we've seen, if, look, if you look at Central Europe, for example, over the last 20 years, the wage growth you've seen is tremendous. It's absolutely tremendous. And as Nella was saying, it's on the back of a fantastic economic transformation, uh, leveraging qualified labor force and driving economic uh, growth. All of that in the framework of a very strong legal um, and social uh, framework which was given to that region by the EU. It's an un, uh, unnoticed achievement, but uh, a very uh, strong point. So going back to the point, um, we see there, and we see also in the risk cost on the consumer lending, extremely low risk cost and, and, and very strong demand for lending because that's what people do. If they get good income, then they see they can borrow and basically make today their life better based on tomorrow's income. Southeast Asia um, has suffered massively during the uh, COVID, um, but is rebounding extremely quickly, I have to say, uh, extremely quickly. Uh, one of the reasons I think is that um, people there are earning and spending directly. So as soon as the economy has restarted, they had to restart. You have no massive resignation in Southeast Asia. People are back to work because they need to, uh, they need to uh, feed themselves, go to school. Man, there, there is no massive resignation effort. And there you see right now a uh, very strong increase in, uh, in demand for lending. As an employer, I also have to tell you, you see massive battle for talent. And I'm going back to one of the points, which is wage inequality. Um, the best way to solve it, from my experience as an employer, is to have uh, good productivity, to have labor, for, la uh, labor laws that are ensuring that you have no social dumping, uh, and strong economy. And then basically wages go up very quickly. Perfect. Um, Mauricio, we've heard a lot about the growing wage gap. How do we fix it? Well, that's a, that's a big question. Let me start by saying that this idea of a very tight labor market, that salaries are going up, there are not enough jobs, people get kind of like extra benefits like a college education to get a basic, to just basically by signing for a basic job. It's not a global issue. I'm, I come from a region of the world Latin America, where we have unemployment rates in the double digits and where the pandemic was devastating for the labor market. And the problems that we're dealing with today is essentially low wages, high unemployment, and add to that today the food crisis because food prices are going up um, as a result of the uh, invasion of Ukraine. So all this makes this a really important topic. When things grow, when problems grow so much, it's also the opportunity to fix them. They become more visible, they are more apparent, and we understand them better. So underlying this situation, and if we rewind prior to the pandemic, what we had in many parts of the world, including Latin America, was very high levels of informality. And the main difference in a job that is in the formal sector versus one in the informal sector, everything else equal, same person, same gender, uh, same job, is that the informal job is paid much less well. And what happened with the pandemic? It amplified that. It exacerbated that problem. Because the informal jobs are the jobs where more contact, personal contact exists, people that, you know, work directly in contact with others. And those jobs cannot really be uh, digitalized or you, know, you cannot do that through Zoom. So the, the wage gap increased. The informal jobs were lost, salaries in the informal sector were uh, compressed, 
And therefore, we have a situation where we really need to make sure that we push employment and salaries up. One, you ask, how? How are we going to do this? Well, it's really about allowing businesses to generate more jobs, to generate employment. So rather than taxing the payroll, which is something that many countries do, especially in Latin America, we need to tax <coughs> other sources of income. We need to tax capital. We need to tax not, not the activity of generating jobs. Uh, that's one element. That's something we need to stop doing. And the other aspect that I think is fundamental in this equation is have gender-based policies because it was women that were most impacted by this. Uh, so we should not be afraid, and, and I say this as a former finance minister, of creating in stronger incentives, more benefits uh, for the generation of formal jobs for women. This has to do with uh, tax issues. This has to do with uh, stimulus packages. This has to do also with skilling. You know, we need to provide more skills. We need to, and we should always emphasize the gender dimension because there is, there is a double wage gap, the formal versus informal, men versus, versus women. And if, if, you're a woman, if, you're, if you're a woman and you work in the informal sector, that's, that's the worst condition, and we need to fix that. Perfect. Along those lines, Neela, you talked a bit about the uneven hit at the beginning of the pandemic. Can you break that down a little bit for us? Who was most affected in terms of you know, lost wages by income, by gender, by race? And what has the recovery been like since then for those groups? A, a lot of my, my remarks on that will, will overlap nicely. We're both economists, so that's not a big surprise. Mm -hmm. Different lenses, though. Um, just to, to pick up on that male-female wage gap, mm -hmm. for example, um, we found that in our data, women were 46% of the US workforce, but took 53% of the losses. And those losses were really acute at times when the pandemic waves were shutting down social infrastructure like schools. So we saw that in September of 2020, women left the labor market at four times the rate of men. What that meant for wages is the gap actually narrowed. It went from 80% gap, um, ma women making 80% of what men made, to 83% of a gap now. Well, that sounds like good news. It is not, I assure you. The reason why that gap narrowed is because so many low-income women in consumer-facing industries lost their jobs. Let's talk about these <coughs> consumer-facing industries because they're part of the social infrastructure. They are childcare, education, healthcare. You need these social infrastructures in place to get full participation of the labor market. And so when women are hit hard, it's not only bad for the family and for the woman, it's bad for the society because those services that are so critical, especially in advanced countries with aging populations or in countries that need uh, specific informal health care and child care services, so that covers pretty much the globe, am I, am I right? Um, mm. Women are needed to show up at work uh, to help support families and growth. Um, and then if I could say a little bit about where the pockets of wage growth are happening, because that's been a big story, uh, this idea that there's this wage price spiral about mm -hmm. to be unleashed that will push inflation even further. Actually, where we're seeing the wage increases is in the bottom quartile of the wage distribution. Uh, that is the only quartile uh, that is currently seeing year-over-year -year growth of about 8% that's keeping up in, with inflation. But we can't just look at growth rates. Levels are important because in that lowest quartile, that's under $2 an hour. That doesn't even you know, come close to buying a gallon of gas. So inflation distorts even good news. We're finally seeing wage growth, but real wages are declining, and they're declining quite quickly uh, for even the middle distribution. And so uh, that issue about skills um, and enhancing those skills leading to a more productive worker uh, and a growing workforce is the solution. And how to get there, I think, is pointing back to your comments, uh, a combination of, uh, of business and government a cooperation mm -hmm. uh, to have a real jobs opportunity and upskilling for low-wage workers. Perfect. 
Um, JP, we hear a lot about fair wages or a living wage. Can you talk a bit about how we should be thinking about these concepts? What consideration should go into them and how, how do we get to that point? Um, I, I, I'm going to take the, uh, the point of view of an employer and probably I share that with a few people here on tables. For me, fair, um, and by the way, to echo some of the things you said about women, um, for me, fair, fair wages are wages that are, A, uh, not dependent on gender or race. That's one first point, um, which is omitted. So we now, for example, in our group, are measuring position by position the, compos the composition of women versus men and reducing the gap progressively. Um, which is quite complicated, by the way, to, uh, to do because uh, for different reasons. But the second thing also with looking at the representation of, as exactly as you said, of women by different level of the strata of the organization, because that's where the biggest gap exists. Uh, it's just through the composition of where they go into the, into the, the pyramid. Um, and there as an employer, if you then have, you're going back to your question, the notion of you want to have fair jobs is you need to have HR policies which basically are allowing to take into consideration maternity leave, <laughs> I mean, very simple. Uh, single mother with kids, I, somebody needs to care of the kids that are after four because they are. So you have to take the care of these issues in the way you organize the work, in the way you manage career, in the way you basically ensure a return position, in the way you manage the upskilling. Uh, and it's, it's rather complicated, I have to say, but if you really collectively as a, as a management team put yourself behind this, there's a lot of things that you can do. If the state on top of that helps by having the right policies, having the right infrastructure, uh, having the right uh, type of vacations and, and, and financial support, then you can, it's also easier to do. And for me, that's a good point. You raise another question, what's a fair job? What's a fair salary? I think as a business here, we have the, the moral obligation to say that a fair salary is not the lowest salary you can get using competition. Um, now, there's a limit to that because if you do that and you're out of job, out of competition, out of the market, you haven't achieved anything. But there's something where you need to be thinking about your representation. I mean, isn't it amazing that after all of these years of lo globalization, technological value creation, everything, you still have this discussion? And why is that? Well, it's very simple. It's because the bargaining power was not on the side of the low-skilled employees. As simple as that. You just had competition through technology, through uh, on-price cost of environmental pollution, through reduction of uh, supply chain improvement. You can basically put into competition a Czech uh, manufacturer, employer, or blue, blue color against the Chinese, against somebody in Namibia. And then it becomes quite complicated. And unless you have super productive infrastructure, very high quality rule of law, you don't have the right required investment in the country to basically create the jobs that can compete. And that's probably one of the issues you have in, in Latin America where you're, you're lacking the raw productivity to basically compete against the most, the better jobs things, better jobs, paid jobs, sorry. Perfect. Uh, Mauricio, you were a government official for a long time and I'm wondering if you can tell us a bit about what types of policies have been most effective, what countries and companies are doing a good job at this? Well, both Neil and JP touched on a very important point, which is productivity. Salaries cannot really go in a different direction than productivity. Really, to in the long run, to increase salaries, you need to have um, productivity improvements. Um, so that the big question is, how do you enhance the productivity of a country? What are the key elements there that will allow or enable firms, corporations, small firms, to uh, increase productivity? And uh, I guess the the list is long, but um, uh, top in my list are issues related to competition. Make sure that there is enough competition. Make sure that uh, there is adequate provision of public goods, say IT, roads, um, that uh, you know, electricity, that, that uh, corporations from the very large to the very small firms can actually uh, benefit from. So productivity is a key element here. Let me bring into the conversation Another element, which I think many times in, in this type of discussion is the elephant in the room, which is the minimum wage. Because minimum wages could be kind of like an easy way out of this problem and say, well, let's raise the minimum wage and then we'll fix the salary problem. And I think we have to be very mindful 
in making those recommendations because that depends a lot on the institutional setting, on the economic context. Um, so for example, if you're in the United States, certainly raising the minimum wage, um, it's something that will be positive from, a, from a, a, a distributional point of view. It will allow segments of the population less skilled to basically earn a higher income. But in countries where already 50%, as in my country, Colombia, of the workers, earn a salary that is below the minimum wage, below the minimum wage. That means the minimum wage is not a minimum wage. It's, it's something that is mandate, mandated in the law. There is a decree that says this is the minimum wage. But employers, at the end, in the informal sector, end up paying less than the minimum wage. If you raise the minimum wage and, and you, you, know, you think you're going to do good because you're going to basically improve incomes, uh, you may end up producing just the opposite result. You may end up sending more people to the informal sector. So it's, it's not simple. It's not easy solutions. It's not about just saying, you know, we have this aspiration, we're going to do this. And to me, this points in the direction of uh, something which is even more important, which is this is not just about regulation. This is not about norms. This is not about laws. It's a lot about the way the economy functions, the culture, the, the organization of companies, the respect for the rule of law. So we need to work in a very comprehensive way. This is not just about you know, fine tuning here and there. It's about really the whole system. So my, my sense here is that we need to raise salaries. But to do that, uh, we need to have better institutions, better enforcement, and also on the side of employers, more incentives for the employer to uh, to hire formal uh, workers pay above minimum wage wages. And I, and I think that's doable. When I was finance minister, I, I thought about this and I said, well, let's cut some taxes that are paid based on the payroll, contributions that employers had to make based on the payroll, and let's convert that into profits taxes or VAT, but let's not do it thinking in terms of the payroll. And it helped. It did help a lot that, that there was a significant reduction of informality. So you have to create the incentives for business to, to operate and generate their jobs and pay them well. I'd like to zoom out a bit to the global picture. And this is a question for any of the three of you. But we're at a point where a lot of companies are rethinking globalization. They're talking about maybe moving their manufacturing facilities or you know, sort of reimagining their supply chains. And that has a big impact, of course, on where jobs are located or how much they pay. And I'm wondering how, how that might impact sort of the inequality that we see from country to country and from sector to sector. I, I can try that one. Mm -hmm. um, and then if, if I may, I'd like to talk about the, the cost of living adjustment as well. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there are two trends that keep uh, labor markets from being completely local. One is demographics meaning that in rich countries you have this issue that a lot of workers will soon be retiring if they haven't already due to the pandemic. So the aging of the workforce, especially in key sectors like bus drivers that carry kids to, to and from school or accountants is a real problem that could be solved by immigration but it could be solved by a new economy that isn't as dependent on location. And so the second trend that you really see emerging, especially after the pandemic, is this idea of digitization, e-commerce. Now, most of the jobs that we're talking about can't be done uh, remotely. But what is also the case is that businesses, if they haven't already, are going to accelerate, are investing in labor-saving technologies. And that is the future. And so what's on the horizon is whether more of these labor-saving technologies replace jobs instead of enhance jobs. And the only way to prevent that from happening globally is to make sure that low-skilled workers have productive enhancements. So those technologies actually help them do their jobs better, which leads to a better uh, profitability for their companies and leads to um, more growth in wages for good reasons that we've, we've described here. And so just to put some, some numbers around it, over the past 30 years in the United States leading up to the pandemic, 
the bottom 10% of, of workers in terms of wages, their wages grew about 1.6%. The middle, about 6%. The top nine, 90%, anyone want to guess? 300%. <laughs> Hundreds. Okay, thirty-seven percent. Yeah. It's huge, <laughs> but it was big in comparison. It's big by itself, and that's because you see that skill premium at the high end. Uh, the skill premium was the source of the inequality, and so that goes back to the original point that that skills premium needs to not be a premium uh, any longer. And then the final question I. I I wanted to address is you can't look at wages in isolation. There's also this cost of living component. Mm -hmm. And we tend to think of these as two separate worlds when they're actually related. The fact that there is shortages in supply, shortages in affordable housing, shortages in access to education and childcare and internet means that the cost of living is rising um, and we're not doing anything to control those costs. So part of having a living wage is making sure that we have a livable community and neighborhood by investing in schools, childcare, uh, broadband and infrastructure that makes it easier to work. Uh, and not so challenging to make up that lost income. Now, to, to from a business perspective, mm -hmm. what you ask as a question is, I can see that it's going to have the following implication. One is you probably will have less foreign direct investment in the countries where a lot of the supply chain was invested in, and that's not going to be good news for these countries. I can see uh, probably some good news for the lower income part of the countries where you have reshoring but I can see impact on the inflation, which might very well eat up all of the increase in, um, in uh, labor that you will get. Now to your point about the skill, um, the, the skill premium, I think we've seen over the last 30 years some mental shift in, the, in what was acceptable uh, in terms of Gini coefficient or difference between uh, salary for very senior talented people and less talented people, where all of a sudden, um, it is okay to grab, if you're the top 10% of a corporation, to grab part of the, ret of the profit you generate, not because of your own work, but because you're leveraging equity, because you're leveraging scale of other people. And the minute that happens, then obviously you're unleashing a potential for increased compensation for very senior people, which frankly speaking, at, uh, when you look at it as an investor, is not justified. <laughs> Because it's sheer luck. It's it's like if it's obviously if you're the, the CEO of a very very large corporation, you can be paid 10 million because of a fraction of everything that is spent is nothing, but it doesn't mean, you know, it should be worth 10 million. It's just still you're selling your time, but that that mental barrier has been broken, and by now you face discussion. How can you ima even imagine hiring somebody that wouldn't be paid at least as much, uh, and that's basically has been driving what you. Uh, what you saw as difference in increase in uh, compensation for the talented people and the, and the less talented people that are only selling their time. So if I, if I may have a take on your question, which is at the end of the day, this tension between the global and the local and with the problems that we're seeing today, you know, very complex situation of the world today, are we moving into the local and therefore would that mean more opportunities for jobs and salaries. Um, and if you think about the crisis of today, what we're having is a whole new generation of crisis. Uh, you know, the COVID crisis, the food crisis today, the climate crisis, and they get compounded, by the way. They're all interrelated and, um, and they can become catastrophic. Um, and one of the responses to this new generation of crisis is, um, well, we're going to rely more on an, our own capabilities. That's the reshoring aspect, or nearshoring our you know, neighbors. Or now the word, and I'm sure you covered that speech in the, in the Washington Post by, by Janet Yellen, the Secretary of the Treasury of the United States. She was talking about French shoring. So it's like, well, well now we're gonna rely on this group of countries that we know, they're, gonna, they're not gonna start a war uh, with us because they're suppliers of these key strategic products. So, I, I really think this age of super optimization is like, you know, you go for the cheapest source of every single item in your value chain. Um, it's over. 
the super optimization yeah. uh, is, is not going to stay there for one reason, because super optimization does not build resilience. It's not resilient. You need to have, you know, ability to adapt to these shocks, to these very uncertain, uh, unpredictable events. You need resilience. Now, we've, now we value much more resilience than two years ago before the COVID. So in building resilience, you have to work with your communities. You have to work with your employees. Employees, you have to make sure that they're, you know, you have to worry about their entire, you know, well-being uh, because that's what makes firms <coughs> succeed, you know. And uh, it's not about super optimizing, uh, you know, doing, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, making sure that every item, every element, every component of your value chain is uh, outsourced to the most efficient one. No, this is about making sure that the whole structure is operational. Perfect. We have about 10 or 15 minutes left, so I'd like to open it up for audience questions. Does anybody have a question? Okay. Um, hi, thank you. I, um, I, I, I deeply appreciate this conversation. I just wonder whether you think there is enough attention to the topic uh, as, a, as an issue that particularly with the talent uh, you know, with the talent scarcity is paid attention, you know, like is, is discussed. I, um, I very, uh, very particularly, I'm, I, I care about Latinas in America, U.S. Latinas, 9% uh, of the population, th there are 31 million people and the least paid in the entire country. Not even Latinas know that there's such a deep, a deep gap. Um, uh, and the disparity of the wages is not so much in the lower income as much as in the higher in the higher income. So I don't think necessarily there's, um, there's a magic bullet, but if there's any, you know, like in a way outside of, um, you know, like in America being, being what it is, if there's anything uh, that in particularly, in particular you can address about like corporate recommendations that could be addressed based on business case in favor of, you know, like based, based on what they, uh, companies would like to see uh, for retention of talent uh, that right nowadays uh, is an issue. If I could say a word about that, because um, it it it's, uh, it's touches a, a very important issue and uh, close to me. Um, you know, everyone is talking about these days about ESG, right? ESG as a metric, ESG as a new standard. Um, you know, ESG is the word of the day or the acronym of the day, and you know, everyone knows it's environment. Um, it's a G for governance, but the social dimension is there. So really, um, companies that want to abide by high ESG standards, they need to make sure that, that the social level, and it includes, for example, uh, the labor force and uh, how they remunerate and what are the practices and the scales and the differences between the top and the minimum uh, paid jobs uh, in, in, in that corporation. I mean, all of that has to become evident. So we should take advantage of the fact that ESG involves metrics. So you have to measure and you have to show. Uh, but let's, let's ensure um, that those metrics include, for example, issues of how do you remunerate, how do you pay um, everyone uh, that is working with you, including, you know, uh, different groups uh, and, uh, and and make sure that you're, you know, you, you're doing something about this because what you're talking about is really an example of uh, double discrimination. If I could pick up on Mauricio's mm -hmm. point, I think that benchmarking is so critical to progress, but benchmarking without accountability is just an exercise in futility. Uh, you need some kind of accountability accountability and hopefully the investment community is one. But another one is young workers. Um, if you look at the data, uh, you see exactly your point about where the gaps are the widest. Uh, women represent about a quarter of senior management, even though they're roughly 50% of the workforce in the United States. The gaps get wider as, as women age, as they become more tenured and experienced relative uh, to where they begin their careers. That doesn't help them in this uh, 
pay gap, it actually uh, makes it worse. Uh, and it doesn't matter if a woman is in an industry with a lot of other women, like in education. The gaps are one of the widest in education between men and women. It doesn't matter if it's a highly lucrative field like finance, another place where the gaps are really wide. So you can see the gaps in, in, in every angle. So the benchmark's important, but what's equally important is accountability. Um, I, I came uh, originally from the tech world, and they would always put out these statistics on their diversity numbers. Mm -hmm. And I used to call it the brotherhood of the lowest common denominator. It was almost like there was this um, you know, comfort in knowing that every company was not making progress. <laughs> and so it's not our fault for not making progress. And I think that accountability was missing. It's coming from investors, but it's also coming from younger workers. Mm -hmm. When we survey uh, workers around the globe, there is a huge uh, value on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and pay equity. And so the future of the workforce really values this, and young people are voting with their feet when they have that opportunity. They are only supporting companies and working at companies that reflect their values. Um, and so I think that's another source of accountability which can help narrow the gaps in the future. Perfect. Any other questions? All right, in the front row. Thank you. Maybe more um, um, three reflections that I'm, I'm struggling with from a European perspective. And so it's more a question, what would you do about it? Or do you see that happening as well? The first one is that I see middle class jobs are uh, quickly uh, disappearing. Mm -hmm. So we end up with the high uh, premium jobs, the high skilled premium jobs, and we end up with a low, uh, low skilled, uh, low paying uh, jobs that are, are numerous. The second one is it's not just about salary. Um, at least not in the Netherlands and France, where I worked as well. It's also about um, um, scheduling. It's about culture on the work floor. It's about being able to combine different jobs. So basically, the whole package. Um, and the third one is um, the gap that you're talking about is not just along salary. It's also along contract form. Because a contract form really makes... Uh, it's for people that they are actually insured against uh, illness, that they build up their pensions. And that's where I see the biggest gap at the moment. Yes, in salaries as well, but in contract form. So basically what we end up is with a huge a number of low-skilled, low-paid uh, flex workers and then some very high-paid um, uh, people with a fixed contract that are able to pay out bonuses. And what you see as an effect for the middle class is that not even though they see their own jobs disappearing, they have to fear that they will fall down to that level of low-paid, low-skilled jobs instead of being able to upskill to those higher-paid jobs. Reflections. And thus a struggle how to solve it. Uh, well, you've stumped yeah, us I, all. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 just a reflection. Just yeah. It's not an answer. It's a reflection. In today's world, um, and we haven't talked much about that, you, you raise the point. Um, especially after COVID, people want flexibility. People want to be able to decide um, when and how to work, work from home, go to the office. Flexibility is now much more valued than in the past. But our labor codes are not very good at that. They're not really made, they were not designed for providing that type of flexibility. So people that want flexibility, especially low skill, uh, they really have to go to the informal sector, uh, which is not good. So we need to redesign our labor laws. So we, we give product, uh, protection. Protection is fundamental. Uh, but, uh, but at the same time, provide enough uh, flexibility. I think that the, the new job market it's going to be a job market where uh, the um, workers will look not just at the compensation, the salary, but will look also at their ability to adjust, to you know, organize their, their lives um, uh, in a way that doesn't compromise their remuneration. Yeah. The, the flexibility factor is key. And we, we see that workers are actually willing to trade off a little bit of wages for flexibility. But it, I also think for the middle class, at, at least in the United States, what's also missing in, is wealth creation. And that used to come from a house. 
uh, the fact that you had four savings through a 30-year mortgage into a investment vehicle called a house that you lived in actually helped build the middle class. And now the middle class can't afford that house. Um, and before the pandemic, there was a real issue about labor mobility, which is also helps close gaps when you have a mobile labor force. Mm -hmm. And for a long time, the U.S. actually enjoyed that. Uh, but that slowed uh, recently because you couldn't afford to go where the good jobs were being produced because it was too expensive to live here, live there along the coast. My hope is that we've broken up some of the geographical barriers to mobility, um, not for every job, uh, especially not for clerical jobs, uh, maybe not for certain middle management jobs, but that there is not, you're not pigeonholed hold by your location. And if that's the case, then hopefully there will be more opportunities uh, in terms of upscaling. I do think for the middle class, the key question is, how do you adapt to the future? Uh, because the, the job that you have now is likely to change, and it's really going to be, uh, again, that partnership between government and business and adapting uh, that level of worker to the new economy that's coming. But that is, by the way, it is happening. Uh, um, I was, um, and we see it in our business, the salary for IT workers, IT developers, tech, tech people uh, in small cities has matched the level of salary in the big cities. Just like this. Because anyway, they work remotely. They work via Zoom, they work via Team. So that, that for that, for this type of people, that is happening extremely quickly. Uh, and for the time being, it's playing to the benefit of the people in the in, in the lower paid region. Uh, it might at some point in time play differently because um, with technology you can co close shore if you really wanted to. It's unfortunately not going to help for the uh, customer facing lower paid jobs in the restaurant and in uh, all of this. And really. I, by the way, I totally echo with you. I think the problem with the middle class hasn't been that the job disappear is that what you could afford with these middle class salaries before yes. is not there anymore because uh, government have been under investment, infrastructure has been under investment because schools, public schools are becoming lousy, therefore you go to private schools. Mm -hmm. While before, at least in Europe, you would basically get a, a standard service for, the, uh, for that and therefore a middle class person could save and, and buy, the, buy, the, uh, buy your house. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if this job disappearing or just in, in French, with popularization and impoverishment, so yeah, that's the word I was looking for. Impoverishment of the middle class. Um. Perfect. Well, thank you guys all for joining us, and thank you to the panelists for a great discussion. Yeah.